Great. Um, well, welcome everyone to our first session of um, Giraffe 101. Uh, today we are going to take a look at a residential mixed use feasibility project. Um, and before we get started, let me just introduce myself. I'm Holly Conrad Smith. I am the head of customer success at Giraffe. Um, that means I am here to help you learn how to use the software and help you to maybe take it to the next level. So um, feel free to schedule time with me in addition to this if you're if you're looking to take a deeper dive into anything. Um, my background is in architectural technology and um, specifically in residential multifamily development. I've worked for multiple developers in the past and then made the jump to the software side uh, just about coming up on a year ago here. So really excited to share with you um, just a 101 intro to draft. So let's get started here. I'll share my draft screen. Awesome. Um, so this demo will take about 25 minutes. I want to remind you that this is intended to be interactive. We've kept the size of the webinar small on purpose um, so that we can make sure that everyone is able to ask questions and um, get any specific needs met. So feel free to interrupt me, just unmute yourself and ask your question at any time. Um, and we'll also leave some open time at the end if you have anything specific you wanna go through. Um, with that out of the way, let's get started. Um, so here I have open my giraffe screen. Um, the first thing that we'll go through is just what is giraffe? Um, so giraffe is at its most basic a geojson editor um, it's a web-based application that allows you to bring together geospatial data building design metrics and connect to the people you're working on a project with um, as you design and create giraffe works alongside you calculating areas and ratios laying out parking analyzing solar and managing data um, there's a lot of giraffe use cases. Uh, you can use it for public engagement, density studies, zoning analysis, carbon tracking. Um, and today we're going to do a feasibility study for residential mixed use. Um, the giraffe skills you'll learn today would apply to any type of development. So just because I'm focusing on residential because that's my expertise, Anything you learn today will apply to industrial, to commercial, to any other kinds of developments you might want to do. Um, here is our user interface to get started. Um, the first thing is your top bar, and the top bar has some um, important information for you to pay attention to. So the first thing is here you have your workspace switcher. If you are in multiple workspaces, um, when you click here, you'll see that list and you'll be able to switch from workspace to workspace. Right next to that is your project selection. So this is a list of all of the projects in your current workspace that you might want to open up. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's also an option to show all of your projects. So if you had projects in multiple workspaces, if you click show all of my projects, you would see all of them in your list. Um, you can start a new project by clicking this new project button, and that will bring up any templates that you have available in your current workspace. Um, I am going to leave this blank for now, but we'll, we can talk a little bit more about templates later on. Um, and then up here as well on the left hand side, you have your menu. Um, menu takes you to some things like project information. You can add layers from here and your export options. Um, and then right next to that is your project navigator. So by default, Giraffe opens up to the map view, but we also have a view called Kanban. 
And the Kanban view allows you to do some project management style tasks with your projects. So all of these cards here represent projects in my workspace. And as you can see, this Kanban is organized by status. Um, so I can come in here and say, actually 1213 North Delaware Ave, that should be in the offer sent status. And I can just adjust those things on the fly here. Um, the other way that you can view your projects is in a table view. And this just gives you a list of all of your projects. Um, you can search for a project by name. And when you click on that project, it pulls up all of the information about that project in the sidebar. So you can put in the description, you can adjust who it's shared with, you can make it into a template, and then you can also adjust all of this information about the project. Um, popping back into the map, on here, let me just close this out real quick. We don't need the portfolio view right now. So popping back into the map, we have on the left-hand side your data palette, and the data palette has layers, properties, and views, and we'll get into properties and views later on in the training. We'll start with layers in just a moment. On the right-hand side is your app palette. So all of your apps are listed here in, um, in this vertical interface. You can add uh, more apps by clicking on the plus sign and any apps that are available to you in your workspace will display here. Um, apps are sort of modular functionality that can be added or removed from a draft project based on what your need is. Um, to start with every draft project, you have your urban tab, your analytics tab, and your solar tab. So those are by default here. Um, once we start drawing, this urban tab will start generating some data. So we'll look at that in just a moment. And then down at the bottom of your screen is your drawing palette. So um, the right hand side of your drawing palette is all of your drawing tools so we've got buildings landscape annotations parking all kinds of options there in the center is where you can manage drawing layers and we'll talk about drawing layers later on in the training and then on the left hand side here is some map controls so you can toggle between 2d and 3d view um, or you can come in here and search for a location. Um, so I'm just going to type in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm actually gonna type in the Phoenix Museum of History because I know I wanna build something nearby to there. So you can see that you can type in a city name, you can type in a point of interest, or you can type in an exact address if that makes sense for you. Um, and it works you know, pretty similarly to what you'd be used to in any other map application like a Google Maps. Um, so that's the user interface. Do we have any questions about that before we get started with our design? Awesome. If no questions, then we'll just move to the next item here. Um, so I am going to start by adding some context to my map. And I am going to do that using data layers. Um, so you can see that my project by default started with some data layers. I have a satellite view um, that I can turn on and off. And that satellite view will give me, you know, your typical satellite. Um, I have 3D buildings, which I can turn on and off. And those 3D buildings come from a data set called OpenStreetMap. So that's sort of an, an openly available data set there. And then I can also toggle on and off the map labels. But I want to add some more data to this map to help me make better decisions. So what I'm going to do first is click on this plus data layer button. And that's going to bring up my layer library and in this layer library you have first a list of all layers and that list contains anything that is publicly available in giraffe already 
or private layers that you've added to your workspace that have been shared with you. So I can just search this layer library for something like contours, for instance, and it'll show me a result of all of the um, contours that might be relevant to my current map location. Um, now, I know that this elevation contours USA 3 depth is the best one to use in the USA. It's um, from the USGS. It's a government provided uh, data set and it's three foot elevation contours. So that's very useful. Um, another one that might be useful for general might, might be like your wetlands or your floodplains. However, we're doing a development in the desert, so wetlands and floodplains don't really apply to this one, so I won't add those. Um, another one that I like to look at is traffic. So I'll just search traffic. And I get this traffic by map box. And then um, the last one I am going to add here is the uh, Phoenix um, light rail. And I'm going to do that because Phoenix has some uh, development uh, areas that are based around light rail stations and light rail areas. So I want to add that just so that I have that contextual information in my map. Um, I'm going to X out of here and just see what all of that looks like now that I've added it. So you can see here that these layers were added to my layer tree here. Just like you saw before, I can make these more or less transparent by using these sliders here. Um, and that data, that data is now available on my map for me to use as context. Um, one other thing that I want to add to this project is a layer that I don't have in my draft library, but I know that it's available. And that is the um, walkable urban code areas for Phoenix. And those areas I find particularly interesting for my residential development because they allow um, less parking for the density that I want to provide. So that'll be easier to provide more units without having to provide as many parking spots if I build something in that area. So here I've just swapped over to my um, Esri map server API, and this is provided by the city of Phoenix. Um, this kind of link is what you would look for visually if you wanted to add a layer by API. And all I'm going to do is just copy this URL, and then I'll pop back into draft and click add data layer again. But now I'm just going to click create my own. And I know this layer is an Esri map server, so I am going to click on the Esri map server or feature server option. And then I'll just paste this URL in there. It's going to fetch that server. Um, I will click next. And then here I can give the layer a new name if I want to. I think that name looks good. And you can see that it's already starting to render that overlay on the map. So I'll just save that layer. <clears throat> and now I have this layer available in my draft project as well. So if I zoom out here, I can see really easily anywhere that that nice creamy yellow is on my map is a place that maybe I want to develop something because I will have that incentive with less parking required. Um, any questions about adding layers so far? Great, seems like it makes sense to everyone. Um, so the next thing I wanna do is actually take a look at our available parcels here in this city. Um, and there are a couple of ways that you could do that. You could look for the parcel outlines the same way I did for the walkable urban code. But I also know that Giraffe has a data set from a company called Regrid. And that Regrid data set has parcels for almost the entire United States and zoning data for most major metros on 
those parcels. So I'm actually going to use that data set in my project and I'm going to get to it by clicking plus data layer. I'm going to go to my workspace layers because I know this layer lives in the giraffe team. And I'll just search regrid. It might be mad at me because I did that in all caps, so I'll just do that in not all caps. Oh. My, my internet may have frozen here. I'm going to turn off my camera to make sure that my internet doesn't get overloaded. So forgive me here. You don't get to look at my face anymore. So here's my regrid data set. I'm going to just click the plus button there next to it. Once my uh, net catches up with me here. There we go. Whoops, not the Metro map. There we go. Awesome. So I have added the regrid data set to my project. And now if I zoom in a little bit further, you'll start to see all of these parcels rendering. Um, and one other really cool thing about that regrid data set is it is in a format that we can now filter and style in Giraffe. So if you notice next to each of these layer names, there is a symbol. And on some of these, the symbol is a little rectangle. On some of them, the symbol is that classic symbol for like an image. Um, so if you have a layer that has that little rectangle next to it, that means it is vector data. And that means that we can search and filter it in Giraffe using Lens. And Lens is just Giraffe's um, name for that filter and search on geospatial data. So what I'm going to do to search this uh, layer is just click the uh, three dots here and open my lens controls. And don't worry that everything just turned black. It's because it removed all of the default styling and it's just visually telling you, okay, you gotta pick something else now. Um, but what happens is my lens options open up here in the top left and the first thing i'm going to do is style this layer so i'm going to click on style and i'll have some options here for circle fill 3d we're going to leave it on fill because i want to style the fill color of each of those parcel shapes and then i have options to color it by all of these different parameters and these parameters are properties that are stored inside that data set. So these are specific to the regrid data set. You might see different properties in different vector layers that you are trying to style. So keep that in mind. Um, but what I am going to style this by is zoning. So I'll just click the zoning. And now you can see that each of those uh, parcels has been recolored based on the specific zoning code that's applied to that parcel. I'm also going to add an outline to the parcels just so it's easier visually to see. And then I'll just close out of that. So now I have this really nice rendering of my different um, different zoning codes. But what I really want to do is start filtering this data set to find exactly what I'm looking for. So I am going to click add a filter. And what I'm going to start with is filtering it by my zoning description. And I only want to see zoning that is already for residential. I don't want to go through all this work of um, revising zoning. So I'm just going to search for residential here. And what happens is it drops out all of the parcels that don't meet that requirement. So now I can see, you know, here are just some just the parcels that meet that designation of residential already. Um, furthermore, I can start filtering by the size. 
Um, I know for the regrid data set that this recorded area number is a good one to search for by size. So I'm going to do is greater than, and maybe I'm going to do it's greater than 4,000 square feet. So that then drops out everything that is too small. Um, if I zoom in a little bit more, I think I will see some more options here. Might have made it too big. Let's try 2000. There we go. Um, so I have now some parcels over here that look like it might meet my requirements. Um, I also had, where was I looking before? Apologies, I am not super familiar with Phoenix itself. I've never been there. I'm sure it's lovely. Um, but yeah, so let's let's use one of these parcels as our um, our location for developing something. Um, I am actually going to instead of doing my filter by zoning description contains, I'm going to actually pick some specific ones. So if I do this. Okay, yeah, it's still going to give me the same ones because that's what was available when I was searching. Perfect. Okay, so I have found some um, potential sites here that I might want to use. Um, I am going to actually turn down my walkable urban code so it's a little bit easier to see what I'm looking at here. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to take a look at this site right here. It's next to a park. Um, it's on a little bit of a side street. Maybe that would be a nice site to build my project. Um, the first thing I can do inside of Lens is just click on this parcel and it's going to show me all of this information in the right hand palette about that parcel. So these are all um, the properties that are contained in that regrid data set. So I can see, for instance, who the owner is. Um, what the estimated parcel value is, um, things like what the last sale price was, what the zoning is. So this is really great, important information. Um, with that information, I can then take this parcel and decide, yeah, that looks like something that's worth exploring. So what I wanna do now is create a new project from that. So before I create a project, does anyone have any questions or comments about the parcel search uh, process? Oh, perfect. Okay, so to create this parcel boundary, I am going to click this orange button in the top right that says draw boundary to save project. And once I click that, I get this little um, dot on my cursor that tells me I am in the boundary creation tool. Um, what I'm actually going to do, though, instead of manually drawing this, is I'm going to right click on this parcel. And I have this option of selecting this outline and clicking set to make my parcel outline match exactly that shape. And now I know that my parcel outline exactly matches my county's data about that parcel. Um, so I can now click Save Project. And here I can put in all kinds of information about this project. So the project name, um, I am just going to name it Giraffe 101 with uh, today's date. But you can name it whatever makes sense for you. And then you can see below that there are all kinds of um, more fields that I can fill in, and these are called workspace properties. And these workspace properties are things that you can set up custom to your company at the workspace level. So we have all kinds of options in here. I'm actually not going to fill it out for this demo, but know that that is available, that you can track things like the status, you can track who it's assigned to, um, you can track things like different environmental considerations. Whatever is important to you for tracking, you can add those properties at the workspace level. Now I'll just save. 
And once I save this project, I have the opportunity to share it. Um, I can share it with specific people using an email. I can share it with a team that's set up in my workspace. So if I have a company with a lot of users, you might set up different teams. Um, or I can share it with my entire workspace. Um, the users that you share with either have to have a license in your workspace or they can use one of their three free view projects to view this project. So um, draft licenses, you when you're using the free one, comes with one project that you can edit and three projects for free that you can view. So if you share this with someone as view only and they have a free license, they'll be able to take a look at it as long as they don't have more than three other ones. Now I'll just click go to project. <clears throat> and I have my parcel boundary set up and I am all ready to go. Um, one thing I want to do before I go any further is just sort of arrange my layers in a way that's going to be most helpful for me. So um, the layers as they are displayed in your list are the order that they render on the map. So if I were to turn on my satellite right now, for instance, it's going to be on top of everything because it's at the top. Um, if I just click and drag that layer, I can put it at the bottom of my list. And then it renders underneath everything. So now you can start to see those regrid outlines. I don't really need the regrid outlines anymore, so I am going to just make those less visible. I'm going to turn off my satellite, and I'm also going to group some of these layers together. So I'm going to actually group my walkable urban code and my regrid together. So what I'm doing is just dragging one layer directly on top of the other. And then it gives me the option to create a group. And now this group, I can toggle on and off that group all in one go. Um, the same thing, I'm going to do this with my transit layers. Put my map box transit layer in there too. And then I can just toggle all of those on and off as I need as well. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is put my contours on the bottom doesn't look like this site has very much contour going on, but sometimes when there is a lot of um, elevation change, it becomes difficult to see. So I like putting it at the bottom here. If I can drag it to the right spot. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so with all of that, we have a project set up and we're ready to start drawing something. Um, before I start drawing, does anyone have any questions? Um, someone asked in the chat, does the satellite function slow down the drawing if you keep it on? And it depends on your computer. Um, so the satellite does take up a lot of graphics calculation. So if you have a computer that maybe doesn't have the strongest graphics card, it can slow down the performance. Um, I typically use satellite when I'm just trying to um, to figure out what the surrounding items are and what the lay of the land is and then i'll keep it turned off except for views which i can show you later in views i'll turn it on for certain views for presentation purposes awesome um great well let's with that um start drawing something um so the first thing i want to do is keep some of these adjacent buildings so i'm going to flip into 3d just to see what's going on here um and i'm going to just then right click and create some of these adjacent buildings and that is so that i can see them in things like solar analysis i can just see them in my um, in my renderings, and I'll just create this one too. So now that I have all of those created, and the way I did that, like you saw, is just right click and then selecting create, just like we did with the um, drawing outline earlier. And now I'm going to select all of them by holding down shift on my keyboard and clicking and dragging, so I can select all of those shapes at once. 
And then I am going to apply the context usage to these. And I use context because it does not calculate anything in my urban calculation. So it's not going to mess up my, um, my actual project metrics, but it does make it so that real shadows render on these for solar analysis. So you can start to see those shadows rendering now. Um, I think. Perfect. And now with that, I can turn off my other 3D buildings. So I am not being distracted by the 3D buildings that were existing on my site. Um, and the next thing that I want to do is just create my um, my setbacks here. So this looks like it's a side street. I probably don't have very severe setbacks, but I'm just going to um, now, whoops, I got to turn back on my regrid so I can right click on it. Just going to right click here on my regrid layer and click create. So that's going to copy a version of that parcel outline onto my map. And then what I can do with that is start adjusting my setbacks. So maybe it's a five foot setback on the front here. Um, and all I'm doing is just dragging these uh, light red arrows and typing in a number so that it gets exactly my five feet that I want it to set back from the edge here. I'll do that again. The site is slightly funky, so I'm getting a little bit of overlap here, but I'll just uh, adjust that. There we go. I'm gonna remove this node so it just lets me go back five. Perfect. I'll just drag that one back. Awesome. So that gives me um, a a setback idea for this site. Um, take that one back a little bit more, maybe. Since this is a funky shape, it's going to be a little bit. There we go. Perfect. Um, so now that uh, we have. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, oh, please. Colin, Sorry to interrupt. Um, when you were now, whilst you're working in 3D view, um, mm -hmm. when you push and pull that kind of polygon that you've created, is that being pushed on just one horizontal plane or is there potential to accidentally kind of like pull one of those nodes into a kind of do you know what i mean so it's a free yeah might, oh, even though you're working in 3d are we still looking at a 2d kind of plane and this does that yes. and stay yes. 2D? yep Gira uh giraffe doesn't you actually can't draw specifically in 3d in giraffe so i can't like um, start drawing a node and then pulling up and having it go on the z-axis. So you're protected from making that kind of mistake. Like you might be in in SketchUp. Um, yeah, you might no, have that's, that's exactly and... what I was kind of referring it back to. To be yeah. honest, that, that, that's yep. great. <laughs> um, so now that I have this shape. I am going to um, actually put it on its own layer so I don't accidentally move it around. And the way I'm going to do that is just click new drawing layer. And I'm going to give this layer the name context. And then I'll just switch back to the properties here. And when I'm looking at the properties palette, think of it as attributes of the shape that you have selected. It's not properties like real estate properties, it's properties like data properties. Um, I know that language gets a little bit confusing when we're working with a real estate software, but um, that's that's what it is. They are attributes of this shape. So one of the attributes of this shape could be its usage which we'll take a look at usages in a second, but it's how you assign assumptions about a geometry. And I'm just gonna make this one have the region usage. Um, and you can see that once I applied the region usage, it gave it all kinds of new assumptions, color, um, label content, if we wanted that. So these are some additional properties that come with that region usage. And then on top of that, um, we can also set which drawing layer it's on as another property of that object. So I'm just going to move it to the context layer. And then when I pop back over to layers, I can click on the three dots and then lock that layer. 
Um, and that way I don't accidentally move this around. Now I'm, I'm not even able to select it. Um, what you do wanna pay attention to is your active layers. So right now I can tell that the context layer is my active layer because the icon is green. So if I started drawing right now, my drawings would go on this locked layer and then I wouldn't be able to move them. It's very confusing sometimes, but generally if you're not able to click on something, it's because you accidentally drew it on a locked layer. So to switch which layer is active, I'm just going to click on the name of the default layer and make that one active. Um, I'm dragging it to the top just so visually it always renders on top. And I know now that my default layer is active because it has this green pencil icon there. Um, and now I think I'm ready to start designing a building here. Um, so what I think I wanna do is because there's this nice green space behind, I kind of wanna leave some of that so that it's available for folks who live in this development. Um, but perhaps I'm okay with it fronting, you know, more towards this existing building on the side. So I am going to start by clicking on my building features tool here, which is the little button that looks like a skyscraper. And when I click that, I see all of these options. And again, all of these options are different usages that can be applied to the shape I'm drawing. We'll get more into usages in a second, but like I said before, it's a set of assumptions for the shape I'm drawing. So I'm going to actually start with um, drawing some retail space on my first floor. And I've selected the retail, uh, the retail usage. And you can see again now that I have this little dot chasing my cursor that's telling me that I have a tool active. And I want to snap right to my edges here. So I'm going to hold down S on my keyboard. And that starts letting me snap to specific corners in my um, project. So that's going to allow me to just click to snap here. I, um, I'm going to pull this out. You know, maybe I want it to be about 75 feet wide. And I just made that 75 feet wide by typing that number in. Um, and I'm going to, again, maybe I want this to be 45 feet deep. So now I have the start of this retail frontage that's going on this front street. Um, I am going to make it only one level. So my building level started here by default with two. I'll just take this down to one. Um, and another thing that I want to do is control the height of this element. So I am going to add a new property here. And that property is actually my floor to floor height. And since I'm going to do a podium style building here, I'm going to do it at 20 feet tall. So now I have this nice start of a podium. Um, I am going to, behind this retail area, um, create a entrance for the residential that I'm going to draw on top. Um, so to do that, I'll use my community. I'm gonna go into actually 2D view so that it's easier for me to snap here. And I'll again, hold down S for snap. Um, I'm trying to make a decision about how I wanna do this. Uh, designing on the fly. I'm just snapping that to the half edge there and then pulling it out to the edge of my site. And now I'm going to make sure that it actually stays inside my site by dragging these nodes to snap to my edges. So now I've got um, on the rear of this retail area, sort of a residential lobby that would lead up to my um, residential tower that I'm going to draw above. When I go into 3D view here, I can see, oh no, my um, community that I just drew has a different floor to floor height than my rest of my podium. So I'm just gonna click on that. I am going to add that floor to floor property again make it 20 so that they both match. Whoops. And now I've got that nice matching size here. Um, 
And then now that I've got my first floor done, and you can see this is how you would do multi-purpose floors. So, you know, sometimes the level of a building has multiple different uh, typologies in it. And in this case, it's retail on the front, uh, community on the rear. But, you know, if you had a mix that's commercial and amenity and maybe there's um, a restaurant or all of these things, you would just draw individual shapes for each of those usages. Um, and next, let's draw some residential on top. So what I'm going to do here is just jump over to my 2D again and just draw my residential right on top of this retail. Um, and then I'm also going to adjust the shape of this rectangle because I want it to extend over this uh, community area as well. So I'm just going to add a node by clicking this um, slightly light red node here in the center. And now that it is white, I know that I've actually added a node here. And when I drag, it's going to drag out that piece of the building. Um, again, to make it snap to my exact building size, I'm just going to snap it to those points underneath that I already created. And now when I go to 3D view, I can see I have this crazy building that is way too tall um, on top of my uh, podium. Um, I'm going to make this smaller, so I'm just going to click to select that residential and I can see that my levels by default on residential is 10. I want that to be more like five at the most, maybe even four. Um, so I've got a four over one podium build here. Um, what I want to draw attention to right away is after I've drawn these three shapes, we have already a ton of data reading out in our urban tab. Um, the urban tab tells us information about what's drawn on the map based on those usages that I've been mentioning over and over again. The usages are very important. You'll see that in a second. Um, so we've got our gross building area, gross floor area, and net rentable for retail, community, and residential. We've got our FAR. Um, we have our uh, building height, um, floor to facade area ratio. We have um, the number of parking spaces required versus the number that are provided. Obviously we haven't drawn any parking yet, so we have zero out of the required 24. And then the last thing we see here is our residential unit mix. So we can see how many studios one, twos, and threes fit into this shape. And then also how many residents we're assuming are going to, to live here. Um, any questions about how to read the urban tab? No, I don't, I, I no, no question about how to read it, but is how, how does it determine the mix? Is that something you're gonna come on to or is, is that like a preset? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> no worries. Perfect segue. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, so the the way it determines these items is through the usage. And what we want to do is edit those usages to match our assumptions. Um, the way you edit a usage is in the usage editor, which is part of this app browser vertical interface that's here. And the usages will always be this black button that looks like a filter on the very top of your app browser. So when I click that, I get this fly out with all of this information. It's got a lot going on. Um, by default, it's going to open up to your residential usage. And we actually want to take a look at that residential usage. So we'll leave it as is, but you can drop this down and see every other usage in your project. Um, you can also clone this usage to make a copy if you wanted another version of residential, for instance, um, but we'll just leave the default one for today. You can see that the residential usage is a building type usage from this dropdown. There's a few other usage types. 
And that controls like the master list of attributes that get assigned with that usage type. So building types always include things like efficiency and floor to floor and, um, you know, graphics like the, the color and the line width and your some of your cost information, whereas a landscape usage is not going to include floor to floor because landscape is flat. So they just control like the master list of properties that get added. Um, down below here, since we're looking at a building usage, we're seeing our efficiency. And this efficiency is what drives your gross building area, your gross floor area, and your net rentable area. Um, so we can see that we're assuming with this building that it has an 80% efficiency and a 72% cell efficiency. And the difference between efficiency and cell efficiency kind of varies from municipality to municipality on what they want included in those. But usually efficiency um, is just removing things like the wall widths and um, maybe your cores, whereas cell efficiency is removing anything that's not part of the unit. So it would remove your corridors. If you had amenity space, your cell efficiency would be much less efficient, things like that. Um, I'm going to say because this building is pretty small that we're going for a pretty efficient building. So I'm actually going to up that cell efficiency to 80% here. Um, next, you can set your floor to floor height. Um, I'm just going to make these 11 feet tall. Or I'm not actually sure exactly what the height limit is on buildings in this zoning code. Again, I'm not super familiar with Phoenix, but we'll just assume that we can go a little bit taller. So we'll give people a little bit more headroom. Um, and then the next thing down is where you're setting those assumptions about your unit mix. So exactly what we were asking about before. Um, so by default, the residential usage has these four unit types, studio through three bed. I can add um, another dwelling type if I want. So if I wanted four beds, for instance, I could just type that in and click add and it would add another um, dwelling type here. It added it on the end, but I can drag it to the other end if I want. I actually don't want four beds, so I'm just going to delete it. Um, and then what I can do as well is start setting the size assumptions for these different unit types. Now, I know something for the Phoenix code, at least the last time I looked, is that up to 600 square feet, there's actually no parking required for that unit. So I'm going to make these studio units just a little bit bigger, but I am going to remove the parking requirement. Um, and I'm going to also make them, you know, a little bit more expensive per month. So this price for residential by default is assuming a rental price per month but you could make it into a sale price. You could make it into a price per square foot if you wanted to. It's sort of how you want to manage your data down the line. And I'll show you that when we get to analytics in just a moment here. Um, so let me just enter in this, these requirements. I'm gonna do 750. Again, two cars required, and I actually just want to do studios ones and twos for this building because it's a pretty small building. Um, and then to control my mix, I just use these sliders. Very easy and visual. Um, I'm going to have mostly one beds, 15% studios and 20% two beds. Um, down here is some additional uh, data that you can control. If there's any properties that you don't want at all, you can click on the trash can and it just gets rid of that property on the usage. Um, I'm going to change these hard costs to be sort of more in line with what I think is pretty typical for a building of this style. And then after all of those edits, I'm just going to click Save Changes. And those changes all get applied to my model instantly. So when I look back here at my urban tab, I can see now, oh, there's 48 parking spaces required now. Um, and I have a slightly different unit count. I've got 26 units um, based on what's able to fit here. So you can see from that how that usage is driving the outputs in the urban tab.
Does all of that make sense? That was a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense um, up to now. Um, and I'm sure you're about to cover the next, my next question, but in terms of the kind of unit typology, so if you wanted to sort of understand what the one bedroom looks like, what the typical two bedroom looks like in the studio, like how do you see that? And how does the building kind of, all I saw was the building get higher, um, yep. like sort of taller, um, but I didn't see that, I, maybe it was just a view, but I didn't see the kind of building change shape and I was kind of expecting it to change, change shape based on the, um, the change in unit mix. So is, yeah. there, is this, are the pre-settings actually based on unit typologies or is it kind of assumptions at this stage? Um, what I'm demonstrating in Giraffe 101 is our block and stack style. Um, we okay. do have an uh, apartment generative design in Giraffe, and I would do that as a follow-up. Either I have some Giraffe Feature Friday webinars coming up where we take deep dives into specific features, and there's also actually a flow builder big webinar coming up um, at the beginning of April. So I would recommend signing up for that one to see more about generative design. But since this is a 101, we're doing, you know, the the draft basics here. Um, but it right, is okay. possible to see your unit mix visually if you want. Yeah, sure. Okay, that's great. Thanks. And so just sorry, just to just to um, quickly follow up on that question. Um, mm -hmm. at, at this stage, then, is it's quite a high level assumption. Is that safe to say? Um, yes. As in, like, you, we don't really know, and this isn't like a critical kind of, you know, quite a, um, observation. We're more like, um, I'm just trying to understand it. But at this stage, you draw a kind of outline of the building, but you don't really kind of know if the unit mix is possible, kind of based on. Um, as in, if you've got a set of typologies that you wanted to use and apply, um, you don't at this stage know whether it's kind of possible. You just kind of, it's very high level assumptions and you're kind of setting the parameters, is that right? Yep, yeah. So what you would do to control for those um, typologies is just control for their size um, in the block and stack style. So, you know, my studio, I'm assuming is 550 square feet, for instance. Um, and then it tells you based on those sizes that you input, how many of those would fit in the shape that you've drawn. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Got yeah. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I know that we have gone a little bit long, so I won't be offended if any of you need to leave, but I'm going to just keep powering through here. Um, Sorry, it was probably my fault for asking. No, <laughs> no, I'm also very verbose sometimes. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no worries. Um, so what I do want to show before we sign off here definitely is how to solve for parking. And the last thing I want to show is analytics. So I'll do how to solve for parking quickly, and then I will show you analytics. Um, so. The parking tool, just like your building tool, is available in your drawing palette. And I'll just click on the little car. And I'm going to draw to start with an on-grade parking lot and see if we can get enough spaces. I'm going to guess that we probably can't unless we make this whole thing parking, which no one wants. That won't be any fun. Um, but I will just start by, again, using the snaps and just drawing a parking space here, a drawing a parking lot. I'm going to attempt to snap here to my edges, just to fill this in as much as possible, but trying to leave some green space is my goal here, just so that it's not, you know, a dystopic uh, a parking plus building kind of scenario. But I can see that if I do this, I only get 16 out of the required 48 parking spaces. Again, that assumption is controlled by my usage. So if I jump into usage and go to my car park usage, I can see that on grade, we're assuming just over two and a half parking spaces per thousand square feet. Um, you can adjust that assumption based on the size of car parks in your area. Um, 
what I want to do is actually take a look at the car parks visually. So this will show you a sneak hint of um, the generative design capabilities, but this one's very simple. So I like showing it in 101. Um, what I'll do is just click on this car park shape. And then to get to all of my generative design options, I click on open flow builder. And this is going to show me all of the things that I can do to this shape to add more information. Um, the one I'm going to pick, obviously, is the parking base option. And when I click on that, you can see it tries to lay out a parking lot that it thinks is going to be the most optimal layout based on the shape that I provided. Um, I do know that the parking assumptions are a little bit more European. So if you are in the US like me, you'll have to come in here and adjust to be more, make them big enough for our, you know, Escalades and Navigators to fit in there. Um, and now I can see this parking layout. I've got 15 out of 48 parking spaces provided. I can try to adjust the way that this renders by changing the reference edge. So I can see there that I actually got a few more spaces. So that was good, um, but I still don't have enough. So what I need to do is change this from an on grade parking to a multi deck. And then I might be able to get a little bit closer. Um, and now that I've made this a two level um, on grade or a two level parking deck, now I have 34 out of the required 48. And I actually know because I designed this building in that special part, in that special zoning overlay of Phoenix, that that's almost enough parking spaces. And I can probably squeeze in one or two more um, because I can get a 25% reduction in required parking spaces because I am in this overlay. So that's good. Um, I'm actually probably good with this two level parking deck, which allows me to then provide maybe a nice patio area or, you know, something a little more amenitized here in the front, instead of having to fill it with parking, which, which feels much nicer to me. Um, any questions about parking before I show you analytics quickly? Nope. Awesome. So analytics is actually my favorite app in Giraffe because I come from a construction estimating background. So I love looking at the numbers in depth. Um, and that's what exactly what you do in analytics. So the urban tab gives you this very high level overview. These are metrics that pretty much everyone needs to look at. So they're very generic. Um, but every company, every developer, every designer is going to have specific metrics that they want to look at that are important to them. And that's why we have um, the analytics application that allows you to design your own metrics. And what I'm going to do here is bring in um, an analytics schema that I have from another project. So we can just take a look at that together. I'll just select all, import these keep existing usages. Right. So now what I can see in my import here is um, I'm actually estimating a stabilized return on cost of about 3% for this development. So that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, some other things that I can look at here are maybe some tax revenue impact. So if I'm going to the community and saying, you know, this is what I'm trying to develop here, I think it's going to benefit you with, you know, XYZ amount of tax revenue every year. Um, here's my breakdown of different densities um, based on what I've drawn. So you can really design almost anything in your um, in your analytics to match your assumptions. Um, building out your analytics tab is a project, but once you have it, you can do exactly what I just did and import it into every single project and have that data live as you're drawing. So if I were to make you know this building any larger, it's going to adjust my numbers live as I'm drawing. So now any project that I design, I will have these cost assumptions immediately 
uh, calculating. So it's really powerful. It is an initial um, setup chore, I will say. I am completely happy to help you build it, um, but it's so worth it because once you have it built out, you have this on every single project and you know your pro forma is automatically filled out or the you know density calculations that you need to provide to the city are automatically filled out no more manual inputs into spreadsheets and things like that um any any questions on analytics i know i just gave the like highest overview possible of that but just just let me know if you want to see something more more detailed there just curious um mm -hmm. Molly, how how long did it take you to kind of build out that, you know, uh, coming coming at it from a kind of somebody who knows giraffe very well? When you say it's a bit of a project to build that up, how long did it take you? Um, it probably took me about two hours to build it. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, but you know, I use it literally on every project now, so <laughs> I I consider it worth worth the time input for sure. Yeah, sure. Looks great. Um, so the the last thing I did want to show is our um, views functionality. Um, I know that's we are now six minutes over time, but I am just going to show it real quick. And again, if you need to jump, I won't be offended. Um, but views is really helpful for presentations, so I just want to show how that works. Um, so I am going to set up maybe a camera angle that I think is attractive of this building here. That one looks good. And all views are are snapshots of your um, of your project from different camera angles. But you can also include different context layers in each of those camera angles so it can tell a really nice story about your project. So I am just going to name this one front. Save that. And then what I want to do is actually make another view that shows kind of this project in context of its surroundings. So I'll turn on my walkable urban code layer. Whoops, not drag it out. Turn it on. So I can see that this is part of the walkable urban code. I can see um, my transit stop is right here, so that's really great. Um, and I'll just zoom in a little bit there. Save my layer opacities, that's important, so that it comes up in my view. And then I'll just save another view here and call it context. And now once I have these couple of views built out, as I am talking through my project with a client or with the city or with the neighborhood association, I can tell a little story. So, you know, here we're looking at the front of this development. This is what it'll feel like as you're driving in here. This development is part of a zone in the walkable urban code. It's definitely walkable to this transit stop over here, but it still feels situated as part of the neighborhood. You know, the whole story that you would tell about this project is set up through your views. Um, you can also use views um, to export high res images. So if I were to go to um, menu export, there's an image PDF export that gives you really nice exports for your presentations. And coming up very soon here, we are going to have a really nice report builder. Um, so these views you'll be able to add to your report that you build inside of Giraffe as well, which is going to be so great, especially for um, you know developers and consultants that need to present to clients a lot. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, and with that, that wraps up Giraffe 101. That's sort of everything you need to know to get started from creating a project all the way through presenting your project to your stakeholders. Um, before we sign off here, I can hang out for a couple more minutes for any more questions if the two of you have questions, but otherwise um, we'll, we'll send out a recording of this in, in the next couple of hours.
Thanks, Holly. It's been a great overview. Um, really interesting. Makes me want to kind of get going with it, really, and just start using it a bit more. Um, I just had two questions, and I think they're sure. pretty basic. With the, um, the analytics, is there a way that you can export that or kind of lay it out on a sheet with the images, yeah. or is that, is that going to come as part of the kind of report app that you, you mentioned in development? Yeah, so exporting it along with the images will be part of the report builder. Um, however, you can export your analytics as a um, CSV format now. So mm -hmm. I just opened up the configure, which takes you into your analytics menu, and I can go to export, and you get this nice export of your analytics data. Got it. Okay, great. Um, and then my second question was really simple for you, I'm sure. Um, how do you set the metrics? So I know you're, you're obviously working in feet and inches, but I work in sort of, uh, millimeters and, and meters. Um, yep. How's the best way to do that? Um, first, it should automatically detect where you are in the world and give you the correct units. Um, ah, okay, amazing. However, <laughs> if it ever doesn't do that, you can reset your units in the project settings. So I okay. go to menu, projects, project settings, and then under the system properties, you can change the units of measure here. Perfect. That's great. Wonderful. Well, I have no more questions, but thank you so much for your time. It's been really Yeah. Great. You're welcome. Thanks for, for coming. And if you ever have any questions for me, um, if you're working during USA time zone, um, if you use this get in touch button in the bottom right, you can chat directly with me from the app. If it is more of an Australia time zone, you'll get someone on the Australia team replying, but we do have almost 24 hour coverage on the chat. So pretty good there. Perfect, sounds great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you joining us um, and hopefully we'll see you in the app very soon. Brilliant, thanks again, Holly, much appreciated. Thanks. Bye-bye.